we'll be finishing up the chemistry part of our continuing education at Pest Now. We're going to look at imidacloprid. We use it in a couple of phases at Pest Now, but primarily today we're going to look at it as a termiticide, even though we do use it as an insecticide for certain situations like ants. But I think you'll find today is going to be primarily on uh, termite work. We'll examine imidacloprid and what it does for our company, and what it does for the consumer, and how it can hurt, how it can help, and what happens when it doesn't work. We'll also be reviewing back on rodenticide and also on bifenthrin. So when you take your exam, do a little studying up so that uh, on your previous two months of training that we'll be able to, uh, you'll be able to successfully complete that exam. Like we do for all our training, we're going to look at number one, what is it? What exactly is the chemical compound? Uh, what do we use it for? And exactly what it does for, as I said, the consumer and the uh, for the company. We're also going to look at how it works. It's not any good to know what you're, I mean, it does me no good to put training out there if you don't know exactly how this product works. When a consumer asks you, hey, how does this stuff work? You need to be able to answer it intelligently. Also, one of the things I think is most important is what happens when it doesn't work. I will tell you right now that imidacloprid and any product we use is 100% chemistry effective. You take a Petri dish, drop a bug in it, put imidacloprid in it or any of our products, that bug will automatically die. It is 100% fail proof. So why does products not work sometimes? When you treat it, all of a sudden you have reoccurrences of termites or ants. You go, well, the product didn't work. That's not the case. Things affect product and make it where it's not as efficient or it doesn't work at all. And it's your job to determine why that product didn't work. As I said, it's 100% effective. So something had to cause it not to work. And that's your job as a professional and a specter or a technician to figure out why it didn't work. So that's one of the biggest things that we're going to examine today. Also, you have to know what the safety features are. How can this product harm yourself as an applicator or how can it harm the environment or your consumers? And that's big because we deal in toxic products. So if we're going to be applying toxic products, we need to know exactly how it will affect us short term, long term, and how it will affect the environment if we use it in an incorrect method. And metacloprid is what I consider a new class of uh, a product. It's been around for quite a while, but it's I call it a new generation because of its non-repellency and uh, its long residual. So exactly what is this? And I think I find it interesting because of, of, of how they originated this. It's a, of course a synthetic insecticide that acts as an insect neurotoxin. It belongs to a class of chemicals called the neonicotinos, which act as a central nervous system deterrent. In other words, it's a it's a nerve agent. The chemical works by interfering with the transmission of stimuli in the insect's nervous system. Imidacloprid is an insecticide also that is made to mimic nicotine. Nicotine is naturally found in many plants, including tobacco. Of course, that's where it basically gets the name from. And it's toxic to insect, especially uh, sucking insects, termites, insects that are in the soil. And at one time, it was really developed to help with agriculture because it's a systemic. We're going to go over all this, but the product has the ability to be absorbed up into plants once applied to the plant or in the soil. Now that's good, but it's also bad because that product being of toxic nature to a degree is absorbed by the plant. So if the insect eats it, if it's used for agriculture, then it digests part of that toxic product. And of course it keeps the <laughs> bugs off the insects, but it also has a little bit of residual left in the, uh, the vegetation. So we're going to look at all that because when it's used for termiticide, it's completely different. It's not a uh, agricultural plant. It is a soil injection. We'll go over the, the, the pluses and the minuses of it. It's a great product, but it has some extremely environmental toxic effects if not used properly. As I said today, imidacloprid is used in a lot of products. The main one we're looking at is for termiticide. And what we use today is called Centifar. Uh, 75 WSP. You should know what those little abbreviations are for. That stands for wettable soluble packet because a, a packet will come and, a, and a, the package that you see, I mean, it has four little packets in it and which it dissolves in the uh, in the water in the bowl once you place it in there. It's very easy to mix. It's uh, low risk in, that, in mixing and applying as far as that goes. And what I find interesting and you'll have to know as an inspector, not so much as a technician, is that it's made by Bayer Corporation and it's actually a generic of Prima 75. 
Premise 75 is Bayer's main product, which is a metoclopr termiticide. What Bayer had was forced to do because of generics hitting the market is they had to develop their own uh, generic. So generic just doesn't carry uh, the main product's name, Premise 75, but it's sold to other uh, distributors under different names. And what we use is Centerfire 75. But if you look at the label and you look at the back of the Centerfire label, it says Bayer product. It's exactly the same product but less costly. So when you're up against competition, they say, well, they're using generics. Well, most people today understand that because most people use generics in their pharmaceuticals. In this case, this is not made by another company. It's not made with other products. It's exactly the same. All it is is a different label, and we can pass that cost savings along to the consumer. The other product that has a metoclopred in it is Fuse. And we use that for our first treatment on ant treatments. It's uh, above the ground application where uh, termiticide is a subsoil injection. Fuse also has, has a metoclopred in it. And what is odd about it, it also has the other brand name termiticide in it, uh, Termidor, which is Fipronil. But we will not go over that today. It's just going to confuse the situation. Let's stay with Centerfire. Let's stay with the metoclopred and how we use it as a termiticide. This also is something you might want to keep with you. If you don't have it, put it in your uh, clipboard or your tablet or whatever, how you store it. And these are the abbreviations that you will have with your different products. Like you'll have a name of a product and these little abbreviations will be attached to it on the side. As I said, in this case, it's WSP, water soluble. It says powder, but in this case, it's packets, water soluble packets. And it tells what the formula is and how it's basically mixed. As a technician or an inspector, you are required not only by law, but protocol for any company to know the exact terminology in the label, how to mix it, how to apply it, and also the first aid, your PPE. So this is a requirement on you. If we spent all day going over a label, we'd have probably a full eight hour session on it. However, your experienced technicians, this isn't put out to uh, beginners and it's not put out to the public, even though the public has access to it if they look at YouTube, but you are the one that carry the MSDS and also the label um, with them at in all, every situation, whether you're mixing, applying, or selling it. So you, it's your responsibility to know this label. You need to know the PPE for application and for mixing, and you also need to know um, the first aid precautions on it. Um, the the Centerfire label and the Premise 75 label, I said, are exactly the same. It's the same product, but you need to know it. Also, the mixing table. That's one thing I like about Centifier and Premise. Uh, it, it comes in a one packet that has four smaller packets in it. Uh, each smaller packet mixes 25 gallons at a 0.05%. And you are allowed to go up to a, a 0.1%, but that is under situations where the ground's too wet. You, you shouldn't even get into this unless you're more experienced and you're directed by your service manager to mix it at 1%. We're going to concentrate on a 0.05% concentrate, and that is uh, one pack with four little packets in it uh, for a mix of 100 gallons. We've already discussed what it is. We all know that it's a, a metoclopred is a, a, a systemic product, and we know it's in the class of neonicotinos. But what we want to know is exactly some of the terms that are used on describing how it works. LSM, you're going to hear this a lot. You're going to hear it if someone's trying to convince someone to purchase it, the benefits of uh, a metoclopred, and you'll also hear it against critics that are uh, that are using LSM as to countersell against it like your competition. LSM means lateral soil movement, and you should be aware of those terms, especially when you're dealing with a metoclopred. LSM means that the product in certain terms is not as stable as some. In other words, once it's introduced to the soil, it has a creep factor. It will expand and creep out a little bit. The advantage of it, if you're trying to sell it, uh, metoclopred with LSM, is that it, get, it provides an overlapping zone. So in other words, in certain areas where the product doesn't stretch quite as far going around the perimeter of a house, LSM allows you uh, to overlap. In other words, it spreads out a little uh, more. The problem I have with LSM, even though I still think this is a choice product over all the termiticides, is that it's just like a rubber band. Sometimes if it expands too greatly, it will snap and you'll have voids in it. That doesn't happen that much, but LSM to me is more critical because if you're dealing with a groundwater well system or if you're dealing with systemic uh, properties on the plants, like if you have tomato plants that are close by, this product is not stable in the soil, so it will creep, and it may creep into that uh, 
into that groundwater well system if you're not careful. Now, when I say lateral soil movement, we're not talking about a great deal of uh, 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 length to it, but we are talking about it does have the property to, the properties to creep, so be aware of that. I like the fact that when you sell it, that it is a forgiving product because it overextends itself and gives you a wider uh, zone to work out of when you're putting a perimeter of a house on. Binding. The way termiticides work, because you once you inject it into the soil, the product, the chemical actually binds with the soil particles. So in other words, that's what gives it its residual, its long lasting effect. I've heard people say it lasts seven years, last five years. You should never put a time limit on it because although the product is a long lasting product, it all depends on the properties of the soil. Is it a clay material? Is it a sandy material? Um, there's a lot of things that affect the longevity of it. So you can't say, that's why termite warranties are only for a year. Uh, most people say, oh, this product lasts seven years. No one, no, it may be in perfect conditions, but in other conditions like moisture, it just, it may, not, it may break down much earlier. So I like the idea that the binding with the soil gives it a, perm a permanent status to it, to a degree. That's why, though, however, when people dig and put plants in and are doing foundations and they disturb the soil, it disrupts that binding. And actually, the warranty states if you disrupt the soil around the area, you must let the termite company know because we have to reestablish the barrier. We call it a zone, but the other people call it a barrier, regardless of what it is. There is a difference, but once it's disrupted, we have to replace it. We've already discussed systemic. Systemic properties of minocloprid. It to me is a is an issue, especially if you're dealing around vegetation, herbs, or any other type of growing material that is consumed in edible material. It has the ability to creep and be systemically drawn up into that plant. That is a that's a problem if the applicator or the inspector doesn't recognize that there are edible plants in that area. Also, groundwater well systems. If you're dealing with a property that has a groundwater well system, this the ability of this thing to the LSM in it, we've already discussed, has the ability to get in it. Now, systemically wouldn't be an issue there, but the LSM certainly would. Zone. A zone is different than a barrier. A barrier doesn't let anything through. It's designed to be actually a barrier. And a zone allows things to go through it and come back. That's important because being a non-repellent, repellent products are associated with barrier because they repel things from it. A zone is like a stealth uh, application. The, the insects do not realize it's there. It doesn't repel them and they're allowed to interact with it. So it, it, it operates in a different way, which I will, will physically show you on uh, some drawings here in just a minute, but be aware of that. Transfer. Transfer is the ability of insects that enter this zone, come out of it alive, and during a grooming process will shift and produce this product and, and share it with the other colony. So in other words, it's like a virus. If I went into an area that was hot, very contagious, got some contagion on me and went back home, I would probably share that contagion. Well, the zone acts that way with, with the metacloprid. And once they groom or share each other or through trophallaxis and grooming, they pass this product to the entire colony. So you have a, an effect that is dynamic because now the termite colony can be several yards away and still be affected by the product that was applied up next to the house. It's, it's really critical and it, it, that's why it's a new generation termiticide because it acts that way. We'll try to give you a, an example here and it will involve transfer, grooming, and trophallaxis. If you can see there's a termite colony kind of roughly drawn on the right of the house and we're dealing with a basement situation here. Under normal circumstances, the termites will send out workers. They'll enter the house, unprotected house. They'll feed, but do you realize the termites do not live in the house? They live deep in the soil, outside the perimeter, sometimes under the slab. But what they do is they'll feed on the wooden members of the house, and they return back to the nest. And through trophallaxis, they will pass their food, their cellulose, back and forth. This, this process is how termites live. The queen and the colony normally are never in the house. They may be close by the house, but it's the workers feeding on the house, just like little freight trains going in there, picking up a load and coming back, and through trophallaxis, regurgitating that cellulose back to the queen and the colony and feeding the soldiers and everybody else that's in there. Termites also constantly groom each other. They're always grooming each other with 
for whatever reason. But by doing so, they're touching each other, and that also will pass any product along to them if they're infected. In this case, there's no protection available, and the termites are randomly going back and forth, basically just eating the house. So what happens in the old treatments when they would come in and do a barrier treatment, the old generation termiticide? The termite guy shows up, injects the product into the soil, and the termites now reach that zone, not zone, that barrier, I'm sorry. They reach the, the old repellent product, and they're repelled by it. So while the house may be protected short term, and it looks like the problem is solved, the problem really isn't solved because the termites are just being deterred from that area because of that barrier. So over time, that barrier will disintegrate and the termites will again break the barrier and get back in. They've really done nothing to the population of the termites. Termites will feed on the roots and debris in the ground. They don't need to hit the house. They'll find other food sources, but they're not going to go anywhere. And barriers have a tendency to break down quite often, actually. Once the barriers break down and they, and they evaporate in the soil or they either just break down due to natural causes over the years, the termites find their way back in. Once they find their way back in, it's the same process. They're destroying the house again. So let's look at it differently now. Let's look at it from a standpoint of view that we're going to use the new product, a metacloprid, and we're going to see how uh, a zone is different than a barrier. In this case, a termite guy shows up. He applies the product, which now is a metacloprid, and it's a uh, non-repellent. Termites are allowed to go right through it. Now, that is something the inspector needs to tell people because people expect instantaneous results magic when you apply this product everything dies well, that's not the way it works and that's not how we want it to work we want the termites to go back into the house pass through the uh, zone and we want them to return but if you'll notice when they return now they're carrying the virus now they're carrying the product on them they're carrying a metacloprid back and through trophallaxis and through grooming and through other interactions they are spreading that product now even though we don't even have to treat the area where the nest is back to the entire colony and now we have I wouldn't say it's colony elimination but it's not a very healthy colony and the only reason we don't say colony, colony elimination is because that's what some of the baits claim but this is the most effective treatment on the market today I like it better than the baits I like it better than the other treatment because this stealth action allows us to kill termites regardless of where they're at non-repellent are zones and that's what if you've been in the industry long enough and you've heard me say that product is perfect, that it's 100% effective. We all know the situation when we have callbacks, warranties, and damage claims. So if I have told you that this product is perfect once it's in a Petri dish, why do we face damage claims? Why do we face certain houses that have callbacks year after year, and their main claim is the product doesn't work? What bothers me is we'll send an inspector out to a house maybe that's had a, a swarm for at least two years, and we apply the product in the exact same manner without ever trying to find out why the first application didn't work. If the product is perfect and the first application did not work, it is your responsibility and you need to be professional enough to find out why it didn't work and correct it, approach it a different way. So let's take a look at some of the reasons why certain things work and certain things do not. The first thing is obstruction. This product works once we can get it to the termites or introduce it to the termites. If something is blocking that introduction of soil injection, then of course the product isn't going to work. Houses, is one of the main reasons that we have, or one locations that we have termite problems is under the front stoop. The reason is when houses are being built, the front stoop is the last thing that is poured. All the debris is pushed out the front door and Instead of cleaning that up, when they come to pour the front stoop, they pour right over top often of the debris. So you have a lot of wooden debris that is stuck inside the soil. That not only attracts the termites, and that's where the damage is going to occur, mostly on the band board and the sill plate in the basement. That's why you should always check under front stoops. But it's also because the, once the house is treated, there those obstructions that the termites have been feeding on are often what deter the product from helping from getting to the termites let's say for instance we have a house here it's being attacked by termites and again the damage is showing up under the front stoop and the termite guy comes in and he applies the product but what just appeared there is wood debris that's been buried in the soil so when he injects the product the product is deflected 
it, remember what I said about lateral soil movement? Well, in this case, it's literally lateral soil movement. It's, it's moved away from the house, and the termites are actually coming in under the treated soil. So you go back out to the house and you just continue to treat the house and the termites keep attacking it, you must realize that the possibility of an obstruction, especially under a front stoop, is what's causing that not to work. That is one problem. When products don't work, that is one problem that you should always consider, which is obstruction. The other situation is, let's say the termite goes in, guy goes in, he applies the product on the perimeter around the house, but it's affected by moisture. Remember, how do we dilute termiticides? We dilute termiticides with water. So if this house particularly has a lot of moisture, a lot of rain got hit, maybe treated a house and all of a sudden we've had a lot of rain, it very possibly, if it's in a sandy soil condition where water is allowed to permeate, get into that product, it can dilute the, it can dilute the product and you would have a uh, potential callback because termites would get in. Once the rain hits that product, it breaks it down if it hasn't had a chance to bind with the soil. Even if it's bound with the soil and the soil is of a sandy material, it could wash that sandy material that was treated away. And once it's treated, once that material has been displaced or dispersed, it's not going to have the, uh, the killing properties of the regular metacloprid. Saturation is a main cause in certain situations. But let's say you're having a problem here and it hasn't really rained. The product's been in a, we got good clay material and uh, our semi clay material and the, and the termite side just seems like it's not working. Well, what you don't realize a lot of times, house is on a sprinkler system. A lot of people are diluting their own product by sprinkler, sprinkler systems that are going up next to the house and just saturating that soil. Continual saturation has the ability to break down products. So you need to examine that. What's causing it? The other situation is the most common. You'll go to a house that's had termite intrusions on a certain area of the house and you just can't figure it out. Whereas someone with a fresh set of eyes goes out there and they say, wait a minute, water is constantly being directed toward the house. We call it hydrostatic pressure. That's water coming in and forcing up against the house because of negative grade. Some water runs naturally up against the house. Water is supposed to run away from the house. And you'll also notice, you see that downspout? There's no, there's no uh, splash block there, and the water's going right down by the footer. That saturate and breaks down any product that's put in the soil. You will never solve a termite problem in a condition like this. Yet we will go back and continue to reapply, 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 and never tell the customer that, you know, you have a situation here that's almost untreatable because of the, the situation with the splash block being absent and the negative grade going back in the house, which is saturating that soil and breaking down your tomato side. There's a reason products don't work, and you need to figure out what those reasons are. That's your job. Here you go. This is one that if you've been a termite guy and you've ever sunk the rod down in and shot the product and it shoots right back in your face, that's when you're dealing with plastic soils. Plastic soils are clays. We, and, and you know, if you're building a house out and you, you're trying to sink a well in or a, 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 a sewer system in, you're going to see if the ground perks. Perk means the ability of, of soil to absorb water. Now, there's extremes. There's plastic soils which will not absorb water and there's sandy material that just lets water flow right through it. You want some kind of semi-plastic soil that will absorb the water and hold it. It, that's a perfect condition. Most houses aren't perfect conditions. When situations don't work and you're continuing to treat the house, but you notice when you sink your rod in and this product shoots right back up at you, that's why you're supposed to wear goggles when applying, then it, you're dealing with a plastic soil that will not absorb the material. In those cases, you have to take special caution, special treatment, and continually insert the product at a slower rate so that the soil, the plastic material can break down and, and, and be introduced to the soil. All soils will not accept certain uh, uh, moisture conditions and, 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 the, and the product will just be locked in. That's what we call the plastic material. The guy goes in, he treats it, and we ha we're dealing with a plastic material right under the stoop. And guess what? The product just gets diverted. It's, a, it's the same as an obstruction because the ground will not absorb it. Now, we're going to get into some other things like how can it hurt me? And pretty much it's the same as bifenthrin, but you still need to be conscious of it. In all situations, you're going to be looking at inhalation, ingestion, 
and dermal. That's why you're supposed to wear gloves. That's why you've got to be very cautious of if you're eating or smoking and you've had the product on your hands, you're going to get it in that way. And inhalation is not, this stuff is still volatile. That still means it can get in the air. So if you're in a crawl space or an enclosed area, you're going to have to be conscious of inhaling the product. That is one of the situations that you as an applicator are going to have to be aware of to keep yourself safe. How can it hurt others? Remember we discussed systemic. There's a tomato plant. We've introduced the product into the soil. And as you can see, the product is with the LSM is moving through the soil. Once it moves through the soil, we're going to hit a systemic properties. It's going to come up into the plant. And all of a sudden, we're eating tomatoes that has been laced with imidacloprid, which is not good. So understand that this product can potentially be lethal if it's too much being introduced into that plant. For sure, it's not going to be good. And by the way, if someone says you treated my house with any of our products, whether it's bifenthrin or metacloprid, and some of the product may have got on it, what do we have to do? Can we just wash the plants off? Of course, the answer is absolutely not. The plants have to be destroyed. Guess who's paying for the plants? Yep. Remember, systemic and LSM. That's how it can hurt you. Now, with LSM, we discussed the water properties on it. We introduced the soil around the house. It hits some type of underground water or it hits uh, the well system, which uh, the well system is designed. It goes into the house. It's encased in uh, gravel, which is essentially a French drain. And the product goes right down the French drain, uh, the gravel into the wellhead, and we've contaminated a well. So we have to be very careful with that. Environmental transfer. Imidacloprid is getting a very bad name. It's bad for bees. So while we use it as a tomatocide, this is not really a factor because we're not treating bushes and stuff, but it is a factor if you're using it as an insecticide because it is what they say is destroying the bee population. And metacloprid is banned in some areas of Europe. Now, as a termiticide, I don't see that being a factor. However, if you're using fuse, it could be, and we're not discuss, discussing fuse, especially if you're treating pollinating plants. What people say is this is going to cause the great insect apocalypse. <laughs> it's not really a laughing matter because there are companies, organizations, and it's, some people can buy this and apply it themselves. Uh, they are causing a catastrophic event that could be detrimental to the entire environment. So we have to be very careful with it. Remember, you're the professionals. Now, what do we do when we're selling against this stuff? It's termite season coming up. So people are going to be out there, and they've had other companies come in. You are now in there, and that little doctor guy there, that's you. Now, young lady up at the top of the screen is a customer and she's asking you because she's other other people in there what what is what is the what do we do what's the best product now, i've had people come in and say termidor widely advertised centricon widely advertised and premise widely advertised of course we're using cinefar and they're going to say that we're using generic products so what do we do in these situations all of these are good let me give you the, exactly what i would do in those situations I, as the professional, would say, one size does not fit all, nor does one product fit every situation or problem. Your situation is unique. You are unique. We are trained, certified, and have all these products available. However, it is my job, the professional, to choose the most efficient, most cost-effective, and most importantly, the safest product and treatment plan for your specific problem and your specific structure. Sometimes it's Termidor. Sometimes it's Centricon. But in most of the cases, we're going to be able to use Cinefar, which is a great product. It, it, it hits all the, the, the tags. And cost effectiveness is the best product to use and the safest product to use in this case. However, if you say that you want a different product, we have it. But remember, it's my job to determine the safest, most cost effective, and the most efficient for this specific problem. People get mad when you tell them, well, this is what we use on every house. No, it's not on every house. And by the way, when, we, when we're discussing brand names and products, like a lot of companies sell brand name, they sell Termidor. I've never been to a doctor and said I had to have a procedure and he's told me what type of anesthesia he's going to use on me, uh, what, who, what the brand name is, and who makes it. You see, we, he, he's selling professional service. And of course, I'm buying it because I need the treatment. It's the same with you. You're in the pest industry as a professional. 
those specific problems are addressed by you. You've inspected the house. Sometimes there's a well on the property. That's specific. Sometimes there is negative grade on a property. That's specific. Sometimes there's a situation you'll recommend something else. That's why the consumer needs to know that you are looking at that specific house. They are special. And you're going to describe what you think is best, not what is the most advertised or what is the most often quoted by other companies. Well, that's it. You finished up three sessions of chemical review. Should be good to go. Remember, your exam will be on rodenticide, bifenthrin, and now metacloprid. There'll be questions from all that, so do a little review. Remember, this education, although sometimes it's not convenient, but as a professional, you're always going to be faced with it. What you do with it is up to you. Your success ultimately will depend on the level of training, and you're not going to get to a higher level unless you train, so it's a catch-22. So good luck with it and uh, stay with the program.